The CIA's been on company business for years, so what's been its job in France, Italy, Guatemala, Iran, Cuba, and the Congo? And what does Colby know? And A.G., Jackson, Braden, Nixon, Marchetti, Helms, Bundy, Stockwell, Church. And what about Truman, Ike, Kennedy? The CIA's been on company business in stealth. Now, we find out. This man produced the movie on company business. The CIA's on company business all through Latin America. Maybe in Ecuador, and maybe in Argentina, and maybe in Brazil. But what's the meanie connection and the point of killing an American cop in Uruguay? Who's behind political torture and the bomb squads? The CIA's on company business in the 60s. This man also directed the documentary on company business. The CIA wielded its hand in Chile in 1973. And later on, even while the Senate struggled to figure out exactly what that hand was doing, the ever-active CIA was pushing a strong arm in Angola. And then the CIA's favorite success story came to an end. The CIA in the 70s, on company business. On company business has won awards and has been shown in over 35 countries around the world. Alan Frankovich, its producer and director, is with us tonight to tell us his story on Alternative View. Welcome to Alternative Views. Our guest tonight is Alan Frankovic, who's the filmmaker who made the award-winning documentary On Company Business. That's a three-hour documentary giving a history of and exposing some of the operations of the infamous CIA. To begin, would you like to give some background about what led you to make the film in the first place, to take on the CIA? Well, this was a film which was five years in production, and I started working on it in 1974, 1975. And um, it was apparent to me at that moment, and you have to remember that in 1975 the CIA was uh, under investigation or on the verge of being investigated, that nobody was going to really go into the CIA and arrive at the conclusions that I thought one had to arrive at because of the collusion between the CIA and all institutions of uh, the you know, American establishment. But on the other hand, there, a lot of people were starting to talk for the first time about things which had been done in secret over long periods of time. And I was able, therefore, to interview a whole series of people at every level of, of the CI, from directors down to secretaries and accountants, and then spent a great deal of time actually researching coverage of events. Sometimes uh, this involved CI-created propaganda, which they inserted into uh, the world media, and other times it involved um, contrasting what we were being told was happening in some country and then contrasting that with the CIA uh, operatives telling you what they were really doing and that this was official United States policy except it was conducted secretly so that we the citizens of this country would never know about it. Why did you decide that this was the time to make a film about the CIA. What do you th what did you think needed to be told to the American people about the CIA, and what was your goal in making that film? Well, really, I think the the, the main point really is that this country has had a secret foreign policy ever since the end of the Second World War, uh, and one of the essential instruments has been the the Central Intelligence Agency. In other words, we've had presidents. Every president since Truman has made great moral pronouncements, but the CIA has been the instrument they have used actually too consistently and in every part of the world this is interesting it's not only in third world countries the first CIA operations were in Europe and 
you have the United States government making great moral pronouncements and statements while it's using this instrument to penetrate, infiltrate, and destroy anything which, they, which gets in the way of what they define as the interest of the United States. And if you look at the historical record and you look at the countries the film goes into, you find that, for instance, um, the operations they conduct, they haven't bothered asking us if we felt threatened by this, that, or the other thing. And often there's economic interests that they're defending. As a matter of fact, I would say almost always. Uh, and in some cases, the same entities that in this country went, don't care whether an American worker has a job or not are uh, uh, doing everything they can to destroy the capability of anybody in these other countries controlling their own uh, destiny. I think your film documents very well the infiltration and manipulation of trade unions in the third world where they support the right-wing trade movements to try to keep these countries from forming more radical trade union movements. So you intended just simply to tell the story of the CIA from the end of World War II to the present day, to give a history of it and tell the people the truth, or what you perceived as the truth, about the CIA that the media had covered over? Well, the, uh, the thing was really to, to get people in the CIA who were talking for the first time to sit them down, have them tell the audience what they did and to show consistently over a 30-year period of time that there were certain methods which were used and they had nothing to do with uh, uh, national security, essentially. They had a lot to do with justifying these operations, uh, whether they're against Chile or Guatemala or, or Angola or in European context. They, they had a lot to do with in intervening in the internal affairs of, of a whole series of countries to force them to comply uh, with what the President of the United States wanted these countries to do. And um, these kinds of activities are not something which just happened in, in moments of crisis. They go on every day in every country of the world. Uh, and they're the official but secret foreign policy of this country. And they're done specifically on presidential orders. And what will happen in 1974 and 1975, and I believe uh, it happened primarily because one of the political parties in the form of Richard Nixon, started using the same agency inside this country against, not against dissidents, mind you, because I think against a major political party. And therefore, when that starts happening, you have to tell your, your guys, look, this far, no further. And you start investigating them, you have to make a real investigation because they know all kinds of secrets, they know where all the, berries, the bodies are buried. And therefore, to rein them in, you have to investigate them. But the conclusions I knew in 1974-75, they would never conclude that these were official government operations, that American presidents had ordered them, because the very nature of the CIA is to conduct these operations in secret, in such a way that if the, United, if the CIA is caught, they take the responsibility themselves, and the president of the United States is protected. That is, is that the why, nature. Is that why they said that the CIA was a rogue elephant out of exactly. control? Exactly. That was the conclusion. And if you look, for instance, <clears throat> if you look at the CIA, the assassinations of the CIA, uh, claims they planned but never executed. You will find in the several cases the Church Committee went into, the Lumumba assassination, the assassination of the Commander-in-Chief of the Chilean Army, that a few days before these people are bumped off, a cable will go out saying, don't do it, guys, and nevertheless it goes ahead. And this is, again, standard CI operating procedure. These operations are done to pre preserve the cover and so that the United States then can take a moral position while eliminating someone that they consider to be uh, an obstacle to what they want to accomplish. So, Alan, you know, it, it seems uh, kind of contradictory that the CIA is secret, the people are secret, and yet in your documentary you have interviews with all of these high CIA officials and you were able to talk to so many people. Why is this? Because the CIA, they have a kind of false openness. You see, a lot of what they do, for instance, in overseas posts is they talk to the press, they uh, manipulate the press. I would say that if you you took a percentage of their operations, you would find that a great uh, percentage-wise really have to deal with getting out their line through the media. Because if they accomplish that, in a sense they control the way you see a situation, they control the way you think about a situation. So they have uh, an ability really, and they feel very much at ease with press and media. And uh, they have... Um, God knows the number of books which have been written by former CIA people to take a pro-CI position. And it's only recently that there are some people like John Stockwell, Philip Agee, and a couple of other people who have really 
decided, well, if the pro CI people are writing books, why don't we write books? And, but we'll really go into uh, the nature of, of some of these operations. So well, a lot of these people who are CIA operatives that you interviewed thought they were using you and manipulating you to get their point of view across. Wasn't there a point that they found out that this guy Frankovic may be doing a hatchet job on us? And <laughs> at that time, did you get any less cooperation from the CIA or worse? Did you no, get? No, I don't think they really hassled. paid much attention to what I was doing. You see, uh -huh. because it was, uh, I think, at the moment when they realized that this film was on a scale that they had not even imagined. Because you see, you're dealing with five years of your life. You're dealing with a research effort where I researched for film, background film, in just about every film library in the world. I did a range of interviews of 50 to 60 to 80 people, uh, and um, on the other hand, you have to realize that, for instance, one of the persons interviewed in the film is a former president of CBS News, the founding president of CBS News and Public Affairs, and he says that when he became president of CBS News, they had a relationship with the CIA, they had, he had inherited this relationship, and it involved providing cover to CIA representatives. But it also involved, and this is incredible, providing any material they had in their news library to the CIA. For instance, the CIA wanted to identify somebody in a country who was leading a demonstration. So you're dealing with a level of collusion, and you're dealing with the fact that there is a level of contact at the top level of the networks, and they're reaching 50 million people a night. So what the CIA is concerned about, they're not concerned about a little book or a little newspaper article in the nation. They're concerned about things which really tell you the truth about what they're doing, and in this case, in the CIA on company business, it's entirely told you by people in the agency, and then reaching a large number of people. Because the very reason they keep their operations secret is because it, what they try to explain them to us, they would find very little to justify them. And since this country is still a democracy, we're still allowed to vote, uh, and God knows how long that's going to continue, um, uh, it's going to be... Uh, they, they have to do these things in secret. In other words, they're keeping them not so much from the other countries. Because I'm sure, for instance, in the case of Chile, that the, that the government of Chile knew the CIA was trying to destroy their government. They're trying to keep them from us. And that's why they are very upset with some of the people who wrote books which were much more forthcoming than they would like to be. And that's why this film, because it has reached a, a very large audience, is of concern to them now. But when it was being made, I don't think they really cared. One way or another. At what point did the CIA begin harassing you, if they did? And if so, how did they do it? Did they try to block the distribution in any way? Did they try to defame yeah. you? Particularly since the people who wrote books have been taken to court. Well, you see, the difference is that I never worked for the CIA. Philip Agee and John Stackwell did work for the CIA, yeah. and therefore they have a contractual obligation with the CIA. The second thing is that everything in that film is so thoroughly documented. In other words, as I said, everybody tells you what they did. And, uh, for instance, so William Colby talks about the program they had in Chile and tells you that it was a program that started in the 60s where they channeled a massive uh, sum of money into political parties, which would be just like the Korean CIA deciding that they wanted to fund the Republican Party with $20 million. That they're doing exactly the same thing. In, 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 uh, so uh, it's, it's the structure of the film which is a problem because, as I said, you go through 35 years of history, you see all kinds of things which, which, which people did not know. So the way they have dealt with the film is the, the film was actually shown on the public broadcasting system in uh, 1980. Uh, and that was because uh, there were people in the public broadcasting system who saw that this film was going to be uh, an historic document. It was going to be, uh, it was going to go down as one of the most important documentaries made, uh, you know, in the last so many years. Uh, what they did not realize was the kind of political pressure they were going to get. And so therefore, the re response it was supposed to be shown three times, it was shown once, and they got enormous pressure, and it was yanked. Um, and that's the first thing. The second thing is, rather than deal with any of the facts and challenge any of the facts, they have concocted an international campaign, which is one of the standard things they use, accusing me of being an international terrorist. And I'm the kind of person who doesn't even know how to load a, a 38 caliber pistol. Um, and what they did there was they took, for instance, Certain, uh, I'll give you an example. When I was a student at the University of California, uh, myself and, and uh, my girlfriend and now my wife and some other people, we organized a film society on campus. And the purpose of this was to show films, raise money, 
buy equipment so that uh, students would be able to make films, and we called it the Film Liberation Front. So, in other words, oh. in, this, in, this, <laughs> in this speech and some other Planet articles, a speech that Congressman Larry McDonald made in, from Georgia, he goes down my background and he brings up Alan Frankovich, notorious founder of the Film Liberation Front <laughs> at Berkeley, and you know, and what he, he doesn't say is that I was a fellow of the American Film Institute in 1969, and of the next year a fellow at the American Federation of Arts, and uh, then. Uh, uh, so there's this campaign trying to link us through the through the the very conservative extreme right wing press, Accuracy and Media, mm -hmm. Conservative Digest, because they're trying to ignore giving us any attention, getting into a controversy like the controversy they got into with Missing. But then there's another level is that in some countries, and the one uh, very specific example uh, is Australia. In Australia, the film was a smash hit at the Sydney Film Festival then ran 14 to 16 weeks at, at a, a big theater in Sydney and then in the other cities. And so when I was there, I was invited to show the film to the uh, leadership of the Australian Labor Party, which is like the British Labor Party or the Democratic Party here. It's a, more or less that tendency. The American ambassador found out about this, called up the National Secretary of the Labor Party and threatened them. But again, didn't argue that there was anything in the film that was inaccurate, threatened them that if they came to power again, the United States government would be in the position of having to reconsider relations with this. Uh, and this is a, what's incredible. This is a sovereign country, a political party in a foreign country, which has every right to see anything they want to, particularly a film which had already been shown on public broadcasting here. And it's only a film. It's not that... It's not, I'm quite willing to get into an open debate on any form they want uh, with anyone where we can talk about these things. As a matter of fact, that's what the film was made to, to accomplish. Because... Uh, I don't see CBS doing it, and uh, you can understand why. If the moment they started bringing it out, they would be in the position of, of having to acknowledge their own involvement. And you see, the CIA likes to do that. They like to get you involved, and then they will blackmail you. What has been the reception in the United States? Now, when it played here, for a benefit for John Stockwell, over at the law school auditorium, the place was packed. The right wing could have wiped out all the progressive people in Austin with one well-placed bomb. They were all there that night. Well, it's been, the reviews have been very, very good. And uh, where it's played, it's got very large audiences. And, but we're having to put in the effort to actually get it released again because there are obstacles. And some of the obstacles are commercial obstacles, have to do with the, the nature of the... Uh, of uh, who owns theaters in this country and the fact that documentaries uh, you have to prove that a documentary will have an audience before it will be booked and some of them have to have to do with their, their attempt really to keep us from uh, from reaching this audience and uh, um, you have to realize that they're uh, they have contacts with a lot of people in the media in this country and, and I'm not saying that many, you know, necessarily a lot of people have been bought by them, but they have the capacity to blackmail them, and they also are, they can make a journalist's reputation simply by leaking to him the right kind of information at the right time. That's an enormous power, and if you're an ambitious journalist, you take that into consideration. They have all kinds of ways of corrupting uh, the whole process of the free press. Well, also, a lot of the theater chains around the country are controlled by big multinational corporations. Mm -hmm that can make a political decision not to release certain well, films. In fact, I heard that Reds was being circulated through Texas in a cut version where some group in Dallas was uh, marketing in this region. They cut out a lot of scenes on the grounds that the theater owners wanted a shorter movie. <laughs> well, you see, it's and difficult to say because sometimes that is true. You have to realize that theater owners, one thing motivates them, money. Mm -hmm. And for instance, if they could show on comedy business and make themselves rich, they'd do it. I, mm -hmm. I have to, I, 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 believe me, they would. Mm -hmm. Or a film like Missing, you know, what happened there was the State Department uh, attacked the film and it simply doubled the audiences. So in, in a sense, they've been using uh, these sort of crank, right-wing crank newspapers to attack the film, or, or these accusations that I'm an international terrorist. Uh, because they realized that if they started giving press conferences attacking the film, first of all, they could not sustain their argument. Because, as I said, this film is entirely told you by people who are in the CIA. And they have never found a single fact in it which cannot uh, be defended. Which is pretty remarkable given the amount of information that's on the film. I mean, it's a very dense, informative film. And they haven't been able to challenge anything? No, they tried to challenge it. Yeah. One thing they tried to challenge, actually, 
is uh, this, uh, that the CIA had funded money into the into the labor unions and the trucks, the trucker strike in Chile, right. and they they tried to challenge that on the basis that Seymour Hersh, who broke the story initially, had retracted this. But I, you see, I happen to know why Seymour Hersh retracted it, and it had to do with a deal he made with somebody. But what they don't know is that I have an interview with a Chilean labor attaché, uh, the man who actually organized the trucker strike, which is not in the film. And he conf confirmed that. And so, you know, I'm not a fool. I have <laughs> everything backed up. I have everything backed up, and right. I'd what? like to get into an argument with him. What about overseas? Have you been able to market it overseas, and what's the reception been there? Well, overseas, it's been in 35 countries. It's been, uh, for instance, uh, I just was in Mexico, where the former president of Mexico, I sat with him for three hours. He saw the film. Uh, what was his reaction? His reaction was shock. <laughs> he was who? Who was the, Luis Echeverria? Yeah, according to Phil Agee in his book on um, Inside the Company, he was the uh, contact in Mexico City before he became president with Agee. He was the CIA. Well, you connection. see, you, you have a situation where anybody who was the Minister of Interior in any Latin right. American country would have some contact with the CIA. Right. But one thing you have to realize about the CIA is the CIA has different ways of using people. In other words. You can be convinced that uh, the United States policy is fine and you want to ally yourself with the United States and not even be aware of the other levels of manipulation that they're doing with you. Uh, and they have a way of dragging you in a step at a time. In terms of Vichuarilla's association, I know nothing mm -hmm. about. I do know that when you see the full scope of this and the, and the devious nature of the way they operate and how everything is uh, done in such a way that you might be part of this operation and you won't deliberately won't be given the rest of the parts is that the levels of manipulation are absolutely incredible um, because um, you you manipulate your agents which are the locals in that country and then if you're a CI officer working uh, out of diplomatic cover or on, on business cover you in turn can be manipulated and you will be sacrificed you are expected if you get caught to be sacrificed you will just be left behind and you're supposed to take the blame. That's one of the reasons John Stockwell got turned off on the CIA. He became personally attached to some of the people he worked with in some of his operations mm -hmm. and didn't like to see them get beat up or murdered or whatever once um, he left and the operation had collapsed. Right. Well, there's one of, the, one, uh, the, one of the people interviewed in the film, Joseph Burkholder Smith. He describes the nature of your relationship with an agent as just it's like being a con man working on the mark, in other words, working on your target. The only person who doesn't know what the game is is your target, and you simply are, you lure them in with whatever it is. It can be blackmail, sex, money, it can be ideology. But you have a plan for him or her that they're not aware of, and you simply, uh, and so there's uh, dishonesty at the very basis of the relationship. What about other countries besides Mexico? You said what? So the film's in 30, 35 to 38 countries. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been released, uh, or will be released, in, in just about every European country, or it's been on television in uh, a lot of Latin American countries, in some African countries, uh, in Australia, New Zealand. It's been at 15 to 18 film festivals. And won some prizes? Right. And at, at, at the two prizes, at the two festivals that compete in it, won the top prize. It could not compete in Cannes because it had been at the Berlin Festival. <laughs> well, what about the new information about the CIA that's come out recently? Do you have any taps to what's going on? Any books that are coming out, for instance? Well, there, I, I know of a couple of books coming out, including there's a new book uh, coming out by someone who worked in Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, his name is Ralph McGeehee, which should be coming out in the next few months. But I think you, what you can see, if you see on company business and the kind of methods the CIA has used over the past, you can see their hand uh, in a lot of different parts of the world. Uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, President Carter just admitted, uh, I think at last week's Newsweek or Time, that during the hostage crisis, uh, the United States was using media cover to get its uh, agents into Iran. And of course, the Iranian government at that time was saying that, and no one, none of the media were covering it. And, uh, well, they kicked all the media out at one point on mm -hmm. the ground, and people thought they were just being paranoid. Yes. But here's Carter admitting that they were justified from their point of view. Right, and, and, and you're in the kind of situation uh, where you find all of these things are happening, and you know some country accuses the United States of doing something, and the American media just ignores it or, or, or ridicules it. 
And then five years later, you find out that, in fact, that they'd done all that they'd and done more. All and, more. Mm -hmm. in fact, there was just a document that was leaked to the Washington Post last week, which was a, what, 60-some page document put together by the House of Representatives, not exactly a radical group, um, listing all of the CIA operations in Central America over the last few years and being quite critical. <coughs> Of some of them. Did you get any information on that? Have you seen the booklet yet? Or? No, I haven't seen the booklet yet, but you can see, for instance, uh, in, in Central America, it has to be one of the arenas where they're extremely active. <clears throat> well, they've admitted that they're channeling $19 million into the corporate programs against Nicaragua. And Isn't that something new where they're actually coming out and saying, okay, we're doing this? It is new and it isn't new, you see, because you know what it really is? It's like telling somebody, look, I have this big club here, and either you do, and I'm telling you I've got this club. Now you do what I want, or I'm going to hit you over the head. And it's meant to intimidate, it's meant to frighten, it's meant to, to uh, have people moderate uh, their position. So it's not, because you have to realize that, for instance, during the CIA's program against Cuba, I have, for instance, I must have five hours of material which was filmed by the American media, including I have material which shows in 1961 Frank Sturgis training Cuban liberation fighters in the Everglades, which obviously he, uh, he was working for the CIA then. Right. He, uh, the CIA station in Miami arranged for them uh, to film. He was yeah. one of the people in Watergate. Yes, uh -huh. one of the Watergate people. And, and so possibly the Kennedy assassination. Kennedy assassination, his assassination his right. He pops up everywhere. Right. But, you, but you're in the kind of situation where you have the same thing happening now in Honduras, and you have, the same, and you have photographs being taken of people training in Miami and in California, and it's just like Miami in the early 60s. And if you actually sit down and watch this footage and look at the statements, I mean, you can see them circulating the same press releases almost, except changing the country from Cuba to Nicaragua. You mentioned uh, Cuba. I can't recall how much you went into this in your film. Was this a major topic? And wasn't there also a book recently that came out mm -hmm. by Warren Hinkle, who's a friend of yours, that documents the U.S. operations against Cuba? What's the name of that book? It's, the name of it is The Fish, the Fish is Red, which right. was the code word which they used to inform uh, their underground uh, in Cuba that the Bay of Pigs invasion was going to occur that uh, day or week. Well, the film goes into the, into the Cuban operation in, in some detail because it's the first example of a, of a major paramilitary operation which involved uh, assassinations. It involved destroying the economy and involved and this is told to you by Richard Helms. It involved blowing up bridges. It involved, as a matter of fact, Richard Helms <laughs> in the film says, well, why should I have told the Congress about our attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro when we were essentially killing thousands of Cuban citizens yeah. in this program that went on in years? And, and, uh, Dang fever, you know. Well, it, no, really, with bullets, not oh, even I getting see. into the exotic things. They were blowing up bridges. They were burning down sugar. They were bombing. Uh, they were... Uh, there were terrorist attacks, so they were sponsoring. And what's interesting is through all of this, you know, if you talk to Americans, they think, like, Cuba is such a threat. There has not been, and the CIA has never accused the Cubans of killing a single American citizen in the United States. They have never accused the Cubans of blowing up a single American bridge, a single American industrial plant, and yet they feel perfectly justified to have done this over a period of time. Ships, oil refineries, they've Everything blown they up could. their sugar cane, et mm -hmm. cetera. Chemical warfare, right. bacteriological warfare. In fact, Everything now that I do. think of it, uh, Bill Moyers made a CBS report called the CIA Secret, Secret Army, War, right. or Secret Army, that really documented the U.S. involvement in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Were there things that he left out there that you thought that... Well, what he left out was... Uh, you know, everyone was surprised to see these people give interviews so freely, but, but they had the habit of doing it. I mean, the CIA station in Miami for years had been arranging for them to be interviewed because they wanted to create the impression that this was a, a, a huge movement, uh, that there were all of these Cubans who were just raring to go in and liberate their, their homeland from uh, tyranny, etc. And so a lot of what the CIA does is it's public relations of that sort. It's really creating uh, the appearance of, of uh, this huge movement. And... Uh, uh, everyone was surprised because, you see, uh, I, I have a lot of the stories which go back to uh, 60, 61, 62, that whole period. Every time uh, the Cuban counter-revolutionary groups, or uh, the CIA groups like Alpha 66, had a convention, 
They're, they filmed it, and there were interviews. And before the Bay of Pigs, I have footage of Cuban nationals going around, giving press conferences, and asking for recruits. Now, in this, in the United States, according to the federal code, that is a criminal offense. You cannot mount, it's, it's something they can put you in jail for for five years. You can't recruit foreign armies. Exactly. In the country. Well, how, Alan, would you characterize the CIA under Reagan? Are there new sorts of operations? Is it unleashed on a wider scale? Or is it more or less doing what it had been doing for decades? Well, it's doing what it's been doing for decades, but in a different context, in the sense that, that internationally more people are aware of their methods. And I think the Americans generally understand, some Americans understand. But the, but the CI now has the right to do things inside this country that it never legally could do before. In other words, uh, and I'll predict that in the on using the justification of fighting terrorism, and then in some instances uh, they are going to be encouraging and publicizing terrorist incidents in order to get everyone nervous. You're going to see them start uh, doing things inside this country to control people uh, that um, they've been preparing to do for some, a period of time. In other like words, what? well, they have the right now, for instance, to uh, infiltrate um, any kind of political organization, any kind of uh, group at all uh, in this country, which is uh, what they were not allowed to do before, partly because of the, of the contradictions and the, uh, the problems of jurisdiction between the FBI and the CIA. Uh, and uh, that is uh, really, uh, uh, they can do it on the, on the flimsiest, flimsiest of excuses. And if somebody who is a member of one of these organizations says, hey, I think that guy's a CIA, they can put him in jail for five years. Exactly. As a, as a exactly, because they've just passed felony. this law making it a felony to name the names <clears throat> of CIA people. And that's not going to stop, for instance, foreign newspapers from naming the names of CIA <clears throat> people. It is going to make it very difficult and intimidating for any American press and as I said, the reason the CIA exists is not to keep these covert operations secret from the countries that are being targeted, the Nicaraguans, who are having their own people killed every week, know the CIA is behind these things. We don't, though. We read the things and say, oh, it's just another one of those accusations. These operations are secret to keep them from us and to preclude our deciding what we want our foreign policy to be. And so it becomes moot who you vote for anymore because the presidents are still going to go on using the secret instrument. And that's why I think the issue of covert operations of the CIA is critical. Well, Alan, it's not just the names of agents which can't be talked about anymore. It's any of the activities of, the, of any of the intelligence services, and that includes the FBI or the Bureau of Alcohol, Tax, and Firearms. That means that you wouldn't able, be able to make your documentary on company business now, right? Right, it would be extremely difficult to make, and uh, but it also means that, for instance, if and there are documented incidents, if you have someone in your uh, group who proposes to you a terrorist incident and is actually working for the FBI or the CIA, and this has happened in the past, that you are not even allowed to name, to denounce him at a press conference that so and so has suggested we blow up an oil refinery, etc and that we know that this man is working for the CIA, they could actually throw you in jail for five years for revealing, for doing, for that. revealing that. Yeah. In other words, so you have no form at all of protection. And it's like uh, creating the legal basis for the creation of an enormously powerful secret police force um, inside for use in this country. And that's exactly why, you know, I think Watergate, the Watergate investigation occurred because, as I said, one, in this case, Richard Nixon made a big mistake, and that was to have used the CIA or elements connected with the CI inside this country and against, not against the other major party against the other major party and the other major party was not about to just roll over and die well there are some people who say that it was the CIA who was very instrumental in breaking down Richard Nixon so they, they, because there are people <coughs> because they, they leaked information mm -hmm. about the yeah. tapes for instance yeah but you have existence. to understand that there are people who, uh, who understand that the destruction of the CIA would be its when it gets politicized yeah. in other words if it becomes an instrument where Whatever party is in power appoints a political appointee so they can protect themselves from destabilization efforts. Then it's going to it's going to ruin it as an agency because you see an intelligence agency and there are American presidents and even CIA directors who are concerned about accurate information. I'll give you an example which is a very dramatic one. One of the people interviewed in the film is Jesse Leaf, who was the former CIA chief analyst on Iran. 
His job, among other things, was to take all the intelligence they had from every source, in other words, from their satellite surveillance, from their telephone taps and telecommunications surveillance, uh, from their agents, uh, from in the army, the secret police, uh, whatever, and project, um, first of all, describe what was happening in Iran in every sector of the society, and then project what the trends would be over a certain period of time. And uh, these reports are prepared, and everything is documented. It's like doing a, a thesis. You refer to where you get all the information. He concluded in 1971 or 72 that the whole thing was going to blow up, that the Shah, the level of corruption was extraordinary. The Shah was uh, antagonizing everybody. Everybody was going to unite against him. He prepared this report, and this is on the basis of his honest appraisal, submitted it to the agency, the head of the Iran desk the next day called him in and said, this is unacceptable. He asked why it was unacceptable. He was told it's unacceptable because it's just unacceptable. Well, what he discovered was that this man who had, uh, had on the, uh, worked as a consultant to the Shah, uh, number one. Number two, there were major American economic interests that were at stake, and, and they didn't care what happened in Iran as long as they made $300 million a year profits. If they could get five more years like that, the whole thing could go to hell at the end of the period of time, and they wouldn't give a damn. So, so that's what he was fighting about. This was a single individual. You know, this is like a, this is like an American movie. It's like a Gary Cooper movie. This lone guy, not a gunslinger, walking down the street, representing honesty, etc., and he runs up against this whole structure, which is saying, no, no, we don't care what happens. And in the film, he tells you that he knew that the Savak was torturing people, his boss went to Iran and spent five years organizing the Savak. He had all kinds of reports about this, um, that the CIA was running Iran, that the Shah of Iran was a CIA agent. And this man is the emperor of emperors, the emperor, the Persian king of kings, tracing himself back to Darius and Xerxes. And yet, the CIA <laughs> chief of station would call him up, and he would volunteer information on what was happening in the royal palace. And so w what they see is they see the embassy taken over. And uh, Americans say, my God, these people are ungrateful. We've been channeling all this money. And they don't even know that rather than channeling all this money, uh, they have been bleeding the country dry. They've been running the country. Everyone in Iran knows it. You have, and so the anger comes out of that. And you look at the American media coverage of Iran and compare it with the European media coverage, that's incredible. Um, I know of cases, for instance, where the uh, Iranians made available Sabak agents to the press. They could interview them who were trained in the United States in the International Police Academy. I even know of a case of one man who, when he was trained here, invented a torture instrument, which is a pretty frightening thing, because what it is, it's like a hair dryer, this old woman's hair dryers. And what they would do is they would put it over your head, over your ears, and they would torture you in your own screams. It was designed so it was acoustically Good. such that your own screams would actually reverberate in All your right. ears. And, of course, you might say, well, this man might have been planted. The Iranians are making propaganda, but at least someone should have gone and talked to them. And checked it out. And checked it out. Nobody did. Isn't there a similar story with Vietnam that has become a national uh, scandal recently where there was a CIA analyst, an intelligence analyst in mm -hmm. Vietnam who was supposed to assess the troop strength of the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese troops and would send reports in that were, according to a CBS News report, discounted by Westmoreland and the military right. establishment. Did you, uh, do you have any uh, position on that issue, which is now, I guess, Westmoreland sued CBS, claiming that they defamed him. TV Guide has had giant articles about it, et cetera. Do you have any uh, insight into this issue? Well, I, I know a whole series of other people who were in Vietnam who, who ran into the same problem. In terms of that specific issue, it's clear to me that what happened there, whether Westmoreland, Westmoreland is suing them on the basis of whether he knew or didn't know, is that they really didn't want uh, the facts to come out that, the, that they were not winning the war in Vietnam, just like they don't want the facts to come out that the government they're supporting in El Salvador is losing the war. Right. Because the whole basis of this is, is, to, is to rather than do you know what the American president should do when this country's in a, in a crisis is to get on television and say this is what we have to do there uh, we have uh, just discovered that the Soviet Union is going to invade El Salvador and that we have to do this that and the other thing no what they do is because they know that's not true and in terms of, of Vietnam um, for instance one of the persons I interviewed in the film and this is interesting in, in, if you just remember the recent El Salvador election results 
uh, his name is Paul Sackwa, he was the chief of the, Iran, uh, the Vietnam desk when Colby made his first tour in Vietnam. And he was reading to me cables of how the Vietnamese intelligence service, which is a completely owned adjunct of the CIA then and to the end, they were rigging the elections. He had these cables coming in, you know, were coming in there, his report from his people. And so, I mean, there you have, this is Diem, who right. the CIA later arranges to eliminate. Right. And here you have, you know, a government which invites the United States in, which the United States, first of all, brings to power. And so when, it's like inviting yourself in, you know, it's like having yourself and a big And then uh, manipulating the elections. And then manipulating the elections so that you can bring in someone who will invite you in and make sure that someone who don't, wants to kick you out. Uh, so it, it wouldn't surprise me at all that in terms of the Sam Adams story. But uh, the problem is, how do you get accurate intelligence in if you're discouraging anyone who, who is trying to be honest and report information, which he believes an American president uh, should know, in order precisely to preclude what happened in Iran. Was you know finally, I mean, the relationships that the United States have with Iran are non-existent because so, there's 30 years of secret uh, right. history. This is an important point that the CIA is not really an intelligence agency. They're not providing accurate intelligence, which they're supposed to do by their charter. Rather, they're an arm of covert action. And isn't there something like six major issues where the CIA had either inaccurate information or if they did, in the case of Iran and some Vietnam reports, they were at one place in the bureaucracy kept from the political decision people. Uh -huh. So that they've really been a, a, a major failure as an intelligence agency. No, because, see, because intelligence really is not what concerns you. You're dealing, you know, at the top level, you're dealing with economic interests. You're dealing with why should the President of the United States listen to some little flunky CIA analyst who says, look, this thing in Iran is going to blow up in our faces, uh, people are just going to get mad at us, they're going to kick us out, and this whole thing is going to go to hell. Uh, when, at the same time, somebody's calling up and saying, look, you know, uh, the Shah's our friend, uh, uh, and none of that, but we have uh, major dealings. You know, we're getting $300 million by selling them helicopters. And you see, you have the irony that the U Iran is fighting the war with Iraq now with arms that the Shah bought. And the United States uh, have every reason to believe that they're encouraging the Iraqis, but uh, because, you know, they see the Iranian process as very dangerous uh, because it's a nationalist process. And if it spreads over into Saudi Arabia and the Saudis realize that... Uh, that the kings of Saudi Arabia have sold them down the river and will keep on selling them down the river forever. That, that, that'll have an impact. But the, um, so, uh, the, 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 and you know, one of the most interesting examples in an interesting book, it just came out uh, about the CIA intervention in Guatemala uh, on the basis of documents released. And it's clear that in 1953 or 54, when the CIA got involved in Guatemala, it had nothing at all to do with this communist threat. As a matter of fact, the CIA arranged to plant themselves Russian weapons in Nicaragua and arranged the MOSA discovery of them so that they could justify the communist threat. This comes out, these are actual CIA documents which state this. Mm. Now let's say there, there, is, uh, there was a Soviet threat to Guatemala. And if the CIA is any kind of intelligence organization, it should be able to say and give to the president this information and the president should be able to say, we are now invading Guatemala because there are... And if you go down every instance, you go down to Guatemala, you go down to the Santo Domingo, the famous LBJ thing in Santo Domingo, where he came up with 35 known communists. And these people were enough of a threat to send in 30,000 Marines. This and is in the Dominican Republic other. in 1965, yes. I think. You go down every instance like that. Right. There always is the first thing, the other side is going to do this. Or, you know, in the case of Chile, you have the famous remark that Henry Kissinger made, which was then publicized after the Allende government was overthrown, that Chile is, like, the only threat to Chile is it's a dagger pointed to the heart of Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> and nevertheless, they go down, they destroy the government, they kill the president, and they feel perfectly proper to do this. They feel no problem at all. They feel... You uh, mentioned some people, analysts and all, who apparently try to develop some information relative to the truth in the CIA. Has there been any dissonance in the CIA itself? 
Has there been any mm -hmm. struggles from below and discussed with what the CIA is doing, other than the people who get out and write books? Yes, well, you see, what's interesting is that if you take the American, the Washington press, <laughs> uh, you know, there are all kinds of recent stories appear. And often stories are leaked by somebody in the CIA or another intelligence agency who wants to get even with their boss, they want to <laughs> eliminate their boss. You have to realize that these things are bureaucracy just like an insurance company, and people have all kinds of reasons for telling. And, uh, for instance, Jesse Leaf, who entered the CIA, he told me the story. He entered the CIA. He had come in with a, a younger generation of people who had actually been at American universities and the best American universities during the anti-war days. And so uh, when he entered, uh, his generation of CIA people had a different attitude, like they insisted on child care for their children. Uh, in 1970, actually, there was a furor in the CIA when the United States and Nixon sent the troops into Cambodia. And they had sit-down strikes. They had petitions. And, uh, and the CIA itself, CIA mm -hmm. employees. I'd yes. never heard that. Uh, Jesse Leaf told me. Mm. And, uh, and they're in the kind of situation where you see it's very difficult work in the sense that the kind of people that the CIA looks for are motivated, they're intelligent, um, um, they're aggressive, and you have to believe in what you're doing. And many of the people who later became the CIA's biggest critics, like Philip Agee, he joined the CIA had gone to Catholic school all his life, believed when he joined the CIA he was defending God, democracy, family, anything you can think of. Someone like John Stockwell, same the right. same thing. <clears throat> and uh, when you start realizing that you're defending none of those things, as a matter of fact, you're destroying those things. And I'm not even talking in terms of the immorality of the operations, but you, the CIA is creating the conditions for everyone in the rest of the world to hate this country because they're not paying attention to what our American presidents are saying. We're the ones who have to listen to Ronald Reagan. Thank God he... <laughs> um, they're paying attention to what this country is doing to help them. The people in El Salvador are not paying attention to what Ronald Reagan is saying. Uh, he's trying to bring democracy. They know who's bombing them, and they know where the bombs are coming from, and they know where the shells are coming from, and they know who's training the troops, and they're seeing what those troops are doing. And there's no way you're ever going to convince, you might convince a student that this is right or this is wrong on the basis of uh, abstractions. But when you're a peasant and you've just seen uh, your neighbor's family taken out and all shot down with American bullets, there's no possible way that they're going to buy a Ronald Reagan speech next time around. Alan, do you have any insight into what kind of a person is in the CIA today? We talked about the earlier generation of people that thought they were doing good, fighting for democracy, freedom, et cetera, against communism. We've seen the disillusion of that generation. We've read their books, people like John Stockwell, Philip Agee. What kind of person is in the CIA today after all of these revelations of the evil that they've done all over the world? Is it sort of a cynical, careerist opportunity? Probably, uh, but, uh, but I think they're trying to recreate, you see, the consensus. Uh, and one of the reasons for having investigations was to create, yeah, that was in the past, we were doing mm -hmm. those things, we're not doing them anymore. Because like mm -hmm. I said, um, and you know, a lot of people under, uh, think they're under pressure to get a job, and so the CIA has been very active on campuses recruiting. And, um, uh, but the problem, you see, they're having, as I said, much of the world, I, I think if you mentioned 20 years ago, if you, the word CIA, nobody even knew what it meant. If you mention it today, uh, people might not have a, a very clear sense of what it is, or, uh, but they do know that uh, the CIA had something to do perhaps with assassinating people, that it was involved in the coup in Chile. Uh, the things they might not know is its extensive operation of the trade union movement, its extensive penetration of the American media, its use of religious groups even, and its continuing use of religious groups. Um, but I, I think the kind of people they're looking for are the same kinds of people. Uh, they have to be people who believe in what they're doing, who are motivated. But I think in this case, people are just, some people are probably saying to themselves, well, uh, it's a job like any other job, because a lot of it is pushing around paper and analyzing. You know, the CIA has a lot of intellectual people who do analyses of societies. Same thing you would do if you were a professor, and don't see any problem, because they don't have to face what's at the end of the line, because the CIA is the kind of organization that will, to accomplish many of its most vicious ends, it will be the command and control. It will hire local people, because mm. they're poor, you can buy them uh, very cheaply, and the actual trigger pulling will be done. That might be the one difference between the CIA and, say, other secret police forces, is that the Americans have an American way of doing it, and they don't like 
to pull out the fingernails, you know. In other words, somebody else, just find somebody else to do it. And so you don't have to face the moral consequences. Yeah, that seems to go ahead. Yeah, someone that's working for this agency and seeing all these revelations of all the dirty tricks and evil deeds done by the CIA must know that this agency is doing all of these things. And how can one rationalize this, well, or is it just suppressed? Well, what they do, you see, and this is where, where for instance, they, they, they're trying to do everything they can to destroy the reputations of people like John Stockwell and Philip Agee. Because those people uh, create such a bad example. So therefore, Philip Agee, they have accused him over and over again of working for the Cubans or working for the Soviets. Uh, John Stockwell, the same kinds of things. I mean, the senator from uh, Utah, hatched, uh, essentially got into a, a discussion with him at, at a Senate hearing. Uh, because what they don't want Americans to realize is that they have nothing to do with American patriotism. I mean, I can tell you that the people who are running the CIA now, if they had been in the American Revolution, they would have been running the British Army. How so? I didn't get that. Because they are on the side of manipulation. They don't believe in democracy anywhere. Certainly not here and nowhere. They're they're not uh, interested in uh, in defending anyone's real security. They they're an instrument which defends certain very powerful economic interests, which are just as willing to uh, to see American workers fired if they're not going to be making uh, money as they would to see Guatemalan workers killed. And uh, that's the reality of it. And they've wrapped themselves up in the flag too long. Mm -hmm. You take a person like John McCone, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, on the board of directors of International Telephone and Telegraph, uh, one of the founders of Bechtel Corporation. You look at his life over the last... He has not given a single drop of blood ever to this country. And he certainly made himself enormously rich. And you contrast that with the life of many other people it's gone through. And he, you know appears in the film and justifies what they did in Chile because International Telephone and Telegraph was worried that their telephone company was going to get nationalized in Chile. And the Chilean government did nationalize it and compensated them for their book investment. In other words, their declared investment, $30 million, whatever it is, which they declare as the worth. They didn't feel that was justified because, of course, they were under-declaring what the real wealth was so they wouldn't have to pay taxes. Mm. So they kind of got hoisted by their own little tax evasion scheme. It looks like the CIA, then, is the massive hit squad of the multinational corporate system. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's why the film is called On Company Business. You know, it's interesting that the CI, the people in the CI refer to themselves as the company. Okay, right. And uh, if you look at, uh, strictly, you look at, say, the world situation, the geopolitical situation, the United States has two, and now actually four major rivals. Uh, it used to just be the two major communist countries, the Soviet Union and, 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 and China. The CIA has had, never had any success at all against those two countries. In the 50s, they were parachuting people into uh, Russia to set up guerrillas, and they all got wiped out the moment. China, the same thing. Uh, they've been extremely successful against Guatemala, <laughs> against Iran, against Chile, against Angola against any of a number of countries. Although some of those backfired, like the Angola. Well, a lot of them are going to backfire in the end, you see, because, mm -hmm. because it comes down to you to really think, in the end, that you can control people by beating them down, by getting them mad at you, by making them starve to death and watch their children die at four or five years old. And in the end, I don't think you can, because in the end, if you're going to watch your children die at four or five years old, you're going to come out and fight. That's all you have. That's all you have left. Uh, and so... Uh, uh, and one of the great stories I like to tell is how James Angleton, the head of the CIA's counterintelligence corps, and this is the, the part of the CIA which is designed to protect the CIA from penetration by Soviet agents. Well, the, the highest level Soviet penetration we know of into Western intelligence, at least that I know of, is Kim Philby, who was a top British intelligence officer who was working for the Soviet Union for the last 20 or 30 years. He was stationed in Washington to be the liaison between the CIA and the uh, British Intelligence Service, particularly on Soviet <laughs> affairs. And Kim Philly at one point was in charge of these parachute drops into the Soviet Union. And of course, these people mm. never survived. <laughs> uh, when he was in, in Washington, James Angleton, who loves the British, is a great Anglophile, 
I went to Yale University and things came to Oxford. He would have lunch with Philby about three times a week and God knows what they discussed. I'm not saying that Angleton is working for the Soviet Union, but he certainly couldn't see what was right in front of his face because this man was talking with a British accent, was browbeating him with a British accent, and, and so on. So here you have this great organization with 10,000 employees and God knows what their budget is because that's a secret. Going up and beating up, you know, uh, people in Guatemala, which is no big accomplishment, really, putting the poverty there. You mentioned a couple minutes ago that America had four major enemies, the Soviet Union and Red China, that they'd had well, now no Japan. luck against uh, those two. What are the other two? Well, Japan now, in other words, you would, because you realize the United States... an economic rival. Yeah. But you see, when, the way they look, have to look at it at that level, it's, mm -hmm. it's rivals. Mm -hmm. If Japan is outselling, you know, if, if Americans are buying Toyotas here rather than Chevrolets, they're becoming a rival. And Sony rather than RCA. Exactly. As a final, Western Europe. Yeah. As a final question, can you tell us, during the process of making the film before and afterward, how it changed you, if at all? Well, it changed me in the sense that I knew something about CIA operations, but what I didn't understand is the utter ruthlessness and, and the banality of it. In other words, that it happens day in and day out, and um, that it um, that the people that are involved in this whole process are just, it's like talking to a bunch of insurance executives. They uh, look at themselves as technologists. In other words, they just have, this is a, a technique for destabilization and destroy. They never come to the, uh, the moral consequences, never have to face the moral consequences. And you're dealing with a very, a kind of Rotary Club version of a Gestapo. Uh, because they're smiling, they're affable, they're open. Uh, they, I could say that I got along very well with everybody I interviewed in the film. Uh, but nevertheless, if you look at what happens at the end of the process, and I had occasion to see that because my father was a mining engineer, and so I grew up uh, in Latin American countries, and I had a very early awareness of uh, the relationship and, and say the, the, between the United States and, and some of these other countries. We were uh, supporting every half-assed dictator, military junta, uh, oligarchy that existed uh, in the third world uh, as long as they promised to somehow maintain the status quo which would of course be beneficial to uh, US uh, uh, geopolitical interests uh, military interests big business interests and other uh, special interests have a government agencies like the Congress the Senate committee for example oversight of to oversee the CIA talking about the agency now being under control and that the abuses of the past have now been eliminated as if the agency wasn't under control all along and as if what they call abuses weren't ordered by presidents the main argument is not with the agency which is an instrument for policy execution but the main argument is with the president and the people outside the CIA who determine the interests which have to be protected and how who determine American foreign policy and then call upon the CIA and other agencies to execute that policy. The system is what is wrong. The system is what has to be changed and should be changed. And that's our program for tonight. Watch Alternative Views each week for news and information you won't get anywhere else on television. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, a nonprofit, tax free corporation. We'd love to hear it from you. If you'd like to write us, please write to P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas 78712. Good night.